come up with a, a prescription of uh, describing this decay process, you can four different angular correlation of allowed you know, a possible de decay vector, for example, the momentum of electron and the momentum of emerging uh, anti-electron neutrino, you can get electron neutrino asymmetry. And if you polarize your neutron, now you can have further access to the pair of demodulating observables. For example, this um, the direction of the, the electron momentum relative to the spin of the neutron. So we can have access to the beta asymmetry, neutrino asymmetry, and also this triple correlation that violates both the, the parity inversion and time reversal. So all those coefficients um, all depends on one single parameter, lambda, that is the ratio of the actual vector to vector coupling constant in the weak, weak interaction. So in a simple framework of standard model, all those different coefficients only depend on one single parameter. So therefore, this provides a very powerful system for you to do multiple measurement over constraint a single parameter. So therefore, any kind of deviation from the, from the uh, standard model uh, will, lead, will suggest the existence of new physics beyond the standard model. So this plot is just uh, the lambda parameter here, uh, and then the different coefficient, big B, big A, and little a. You can see that they have different sensitivity to the lambda. So you have to get a, the best lambda measurement, you want to measure big A and little a, the beta symmetry. Okay. So after you measure this beta symmetry, now you can compare uh, the physics uh, in, the, in the hadron system. So it's involving in uh, the U quark converted into, sorry, D quark converted into a U quark in terms of neutral decay. And then in terms of K on decay, the S quark converted into U quark. So this these two process look exactly the same, uh, except the, the quark flavor. And then you can use this to, to extract the value of the CKM matrix, which describes the coupling of quarks between the quarks, because the weak eigenstate is not exactly the same as the best eigenstate. So by measuring BUD, BUF, BUD from neutral decay, BUS from K on decay, and BUB from the, the uh, B meson system, and then you can test the univer univer uh, sorry, unitarity sum rule. So if the square of this amplitude uh, has to be equal to, to 1, if not, that could suggest the existence of the fourth generation of the quark. But most likely that you might also have those corrections, radiative corrections, along one of the <coughs> vertex that allows you to couple to supersymmetric particle, for example. In this has a loop that you can couple to uh, uh, the genome and uh, sparks. So that will also lead to the sum, unitary sum rule to, to deviate from one because of the radiative correction. So by measuring those values to higher precision allows you to peek into the possible existence of this type of physics. Okay, in order to determine the UD, so the angular correlations allow you to, to get the parameter lambda, so which is here. To get access to BUD, now we have to measure the neutral beta to get lifetime, the FT value. So in addition, you know, there are uh, also a lot of unknown correction, the radioactive correction from the external uh, lag and also internal lag here. Um, to, to get the BUD measurement better than uh, 10 to the minus 4, which is uh, the same as the theoretical uncertainty, means the experimentalists need to be, make, be able to measure the asymmetry of the beta asymmetry to the relative ratio to be better than 0.2%. And also to be able to measure the lifetime to better than 0.1%, which is about one, one second precision <coughs> over 880 seconds. So the status of the CTM matrix around year 2002, so there's a, a, a twin. So this, the value, the sum of the, the first row of, the, of this uh, uh, matrix as you deviate from, from one. But later on, a more uh, experiment analysis going on, mostly fixing this amplitude of V, U, S. So from the K on the K system, they correct the number and now bring the uh, C unitarity to, to be consistent with one. So it's good with unitarity. So this one problem seems to be solved. But however, when you look further into the BUD, so that's the, the from the unitarity, you can also get BUD value from uh, 0 plus to 0 plus to 
that are nuclear decay. But then when you look at the landscape of Lambda, there seems to be a, just, they are just all over the place. Even the same collaboration for Kiel, they, they published two, two totally different experts, um, a value. On top of that, we also have inconsistency of neutron decay value. So there's still a lot of um, um, all that need to be addressed until everything seems to be uh, everything comes to a consistency. Consistency. So this one tool I want to introduce now is this uh, new tool we have in the neutrons uh, community is ultra cool neutron. Ultra cool neutrons uh, are just neutrons with very slow uh, small kinetic energy. They move slower uh, with average velocity smaller than uh, eight meter per second, and this corresponds to uh, matter deploying wavelengths larger than 500 angstrom. So this could also have possible uh, application to, say, biophysics or condenser that <coughs> allows you to prove large-scale uh, structure. So they cannot penetrate deep into certain material. Um, so the, the direct application is that you can put those neutrons into your material bottle and track them. So you can apply a lot of the precision atomic physics um, technique onto this nuclear system to probe the high-energy physics um, um, and then look for physics beyond the standard model. So ultra cold neutron, like I said, that you will be bound by the material potential which is mostly coming from the nuclear, nuclear force and it corresponds to about uh, effective uh, 350 nano EV of trapping potential. So the kinetic energy has to be smaller than this, this value in order to be trapped. And this is this energy is so small, so it will also be uh, greatly affected by the gravitational force. So for every um, one meter of increase uh, in height, it will actually lead to the, the drop of the total energy, kinetic energy uh, to be 100 nano EV. You can also apply magnetic force. So um, for unpolarized neutron, uh, under a dipole force, it will actually separate it into a high field seeker and low field seeker. Just, like, just the stern black effect. By taking advantage of this, you can also put the low field seeker inside of a quadruple magnet and trap them using magnetic potential. So those neutrons does not have to touch the material surface at all. This ought to be a very a good advantage to overcome one of the biggest system, systematic in determining the neutron beta decay lifetime in the bottle experiment. <coughs> So those neutrons uh, can be trapped, uh, and you can also use material guides, just stainless steel piping, to guide them from the source to the position of the experiment in a very well shown experiment, allowing you to perform high, um, high precision, low background measurement. And the neutron can be stored in the material bottle up to its beta k lifetime, which allows you 15 seconds, sorry, 15 minutes of long coherence time to do the measurement. Um, the, the greatest advantage is really coming from the possibility of producing 100% neutron polarization. All you have to do is just simply putting neutrons, on polarized neutron, through a large uh, field gradient, which will reject uh, one, one uh, neutron spin and allow another neutron spin to, to pass through. So then, in the downstream of the magnet, you have 100% polarized neutron. So this allows you to construct clean, high precision measurements with reduced well control systematic effects. Okay, so another thing I want to point out is that um, with neutrons, with ultra cool neutrons, we can also measure some exotic interactions, which are supposed to be zero from the standard model prediction. For example, it's actually uh, largely motivated by to explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Sakurai actually point out that in order to explain why the current universe is dominated by matter, uh, at some point in the baryon ge uh, genesis phase, we need uh, the dominating process to violate the barrel number, to violate the CP and C, and also you need to have a strong departure from thermal equilibrium at least to the first order. So the barrel number um, violation can be probed by experiments such as proton <coughs> experiment. And also using ultra neutron or cold neutron, we can look for neutron oscillating to anti-neutron, which is allowed because the charge is neutral. Um, so this, this will, measurement of this type of um, um, experiment, which is actually zero so far, but we'll be able to put constraint on how big those type of interactions should be. And the CP violation, we can access CP violation through the measurement of an electric dipole moment of neutrons. So neut uh, electric dipole moment, because of the coexistence of uh, spin, which 
in the simple non-dictionary ground state. Um, so the the real vector of charge separation, together with the uh, actual vector of spin, leads to the breaking of the discrete symmetry of parity and time reversal. So we know that EDM is a, a mostly time reversal symmetry breaking observable. In order to, to get non-zero electric dipole moment in the framework of standard model, which we have um, source of CPU violation from the CP, from the complex space of the CPM matrix, or from the state term, which describes the self conflict of Rouault. So, um, but the fact that we have a major any EDM already put a very stringent constraint on the strong CP on the state term, which is a so-called strong CP problem. But however, because of the finite uh, theta term, sorry, because of the finite CKM matrix of uh, the complex space, we can get finite um, EDF on the order of 10 to the minus 32 ECM or neutral, which is an extremely small value. So we can just pretty much make that uh, this term because the current experimental limit is on the order of 10 to the minus 26, 26 ECM. So standard model does not cause any measurable background. Um, however, other type of a uh, 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 physics model beyond the standard model involve more particles, more CP violations. You can easily couple the right-handed uh, fermion to left-handed fermion through a loop, through a single loop, as opposed to the standard model which actually require at least three loop effect. So we can have an uh, enhanced size of electric dipole moment on the order of 10 to the minus <coughs> So the size of the electric dipole moment is proportional to the mass of the fermion we are probing over the scale of the CP breaking of the square. So by measuring the electric dipole moment, say 100 times greater than the current limit, 10 to the minus 28 ECM, allow us to probe the physics on the scale of 10 uh, TeV, which is comparable to what LHC is capable of doing now. Okay, the trick to use those free neutrals uh, in the material bottle is just to perform simple nuclear magnetic resonance uh, experiment. So you tilt, the, you tilt the spin of neutral away from the uh, holding magnetic field, it's going to start to process. Now, in, in order to access to the uh, electric dipole moment, you want to apply electric field in addition to the magnetic field by looking for the change of the lower precession frequency allows you to put a limit on the size of the electric dipole moment. So this is a trick. But however, in order to, to actually um, measure this very small quantity on top of the large quantity of the magnetic moment, so we apply 10 milligauss of very highly uniform field around uh, the storage area, and then this will correspond to a frequency about 30 hertz. In order to measure the electric dipole moment to 10 to the minus 28 ECM, we need to measure this frequency to actually 10 to the 7 orders of magnitude better than the frequency uh, of precession just due to a simple magnetic field. Okay, so those are all the experiments um, that you can do, fundamental physics uh, you can do with uh, cold neutron, and especially ultra cold neutron. So for the rest of the talk, I will focus on uh, how do we actually make those ultra cold neutrons. Um, so ultra cold neutron, the idea was first uh, I realized by Fermi, but Zaldovich was the first one who put it in print. Vlad, um, uh, Vlad Mursky actually also realized that you can use magnetic field radiance to trap those, those ultra cold neutrons. And then um, um, Shapiro actually first observed uh, the evidence of those ultra cold neutrons. Also Starrell uh, at that time uh, also independently seen the the evidence of an ultra cold neutron uh, in Germany. <coughs> he also built a turbine source on top of the um, three story high um, uh, reactor at ILL. So he's still a um, um, working ultra cold neutron source after 20 years. Um, Bob Gall and Pendlebury Pender actually extend these ideas of ultra cold neutron. They propose this new um, type of source using condensed matter. Um, uh, type of physics, so-called super simple UCS source. So even though there are a lot of um, uh, possible experiments that you can do, but still we face the largest challenge uh, nowadays is that uh, we need uh, more statistics and we need more ultra cold neutrons. The way to produce them is that you can couple, you can get harvest neutrons coming from uh, reactor or coming from spallation source. So you bombard 
protons to have a Z target to evaporate a lot of fast neutrons. Those neutrons coming out with energy about uh, an order of uh, MeV. And you have to thermalize those neutrons uh, to the same temperature as room temperature water. So it's 25 mini EV. You can also further cool them down to the temperature of a cold moderator, 20 Kelvin liquid helium or liquid deuterium. So now the temperature, the, the energy is effective as, uh, as 2 mini EV. But however, those ultra cool neutrons, I told you that a few slides earlier, the effective energy is 300 nano EV, so 10 to the minus 7 EV. You still need to bridge the gap between mini EV to 10 to the minus 7 EV. So the trick lies in this additional moderator material or UCN converter. We call it super simple converter. Okay, the super simple process is now you have cold neutrons readily available from research reactor coupled to a cold moderator. Now you shine those cold neutrons uh -huh, on just a chunk of solid material. Now the energy dispersion of those uh, uh, neutrons you can select the material so that it match very well with the material. Now the, the neutral energy can be uh, preferentially carried away by creating some waves uh, inside the material. And then the neutral loose energy, then you can collect a lot of the ultra cool neutrons such a way. So this process only re relies on single uh, inelastic scattering process. It does not need multiple scattering like in the typical process of uh, moderation or thermal equilibrium. However, you also have to watch out the inverse process is also possible. The ultra cold neutron wandering around can also be affected by the phonon, by the sound waves that carry, then will uh, pick up this energy and then be off-scatter again. So this is a loss of mechanism. Okay, so really the essence of super thermal ultra cold neutron source is that we're trying to defeat thermal equilibrium. Because the moderator is on a temperature of few Kelvin, if we're trying to create ultra cool neutral, abundant ultra cool neutral on an equivalent temperature of mini Kelvin. So you really don't want some more equilibrium uh, to happen. Um, in other words, you want to prolong the time for the system to reach some more equilibrium. So this is just a, a simple level diagram uh, to illustrate what's really happening. So if I give you a pulse of cold neutron, then over time, as a function of time, the UCM population is going to increase due to inelastic scattering. But if you wait for too long, it's going to start to depopulate huh, into those thermal equilibrium states. Okay. So now the trick is that you want to pick a material, you have a low um, thermalization time, so allow you enough time to collect UCN, um, to accumulate UCN density here. You also, another useful trick is to install a valve separating the UCN from the source. Because source is also a loss, right? Because the inverse process can lead to the resimilization. So if you can actually, at the time of the peak production, now you close the valve, preventing the ultra cool neutron from resimilization uh, with interaction with the material, now you can enjoy the maximum density of ultra cool neutron. Okay. okay, so we did a lot of um, um, research into different uh, materials for intense ultra cool neutron production. Superfluid helium is the canonical material to use. And then solid deuterium also works. So this is the idea. This is the position of the, the source here, and then coupled to a storage bottle. Ultra cool neutrons are produced inside the source, will slowly diffuse out into the material bottle until the density equilibrates on both sides. <coughs> However, the best things can happen inside the solid uh, deuterium uh, source is that one, one this ultra cool neutron will be absorbed by neutron, which is a finite uh, nuclear absorption cross section. So only take only 150 milliseconds uh, for it to get uh, absorbed and lost. Another mechanism is the off-scattering work I talk, uh, told you about. Which will neutron actually met a phonon with finite energy and then get off-scattered into cold neutron which can no longer trap in the material bottle. Which, uh, fortunately, we can control the off-scattering because by changing the temperature, we change the population of phonons inside the material. So by reducing the population phonon, putting down to about 5 Kelvin, you actually bring the lifetime to be equivalent as this uh, nuclear absorption that cannot be turned off. Other thing is that uh, in, in neutral, you also have some contamination of hydrogen, which has a very large nu uh, neutron absorption cross-section. So we have to control the hydrogen impurity to be better than 0.2%, which is actually um, pretty doable in the laboratory. 
One thing we, we find out in the process of this research is this additional loss mechanism that was not predicted before is because uh, deuterium comes in molecular form that has the uh, spin uh, singlet and spin triplet. Okay. In, a, um, in a singlet form, uh, the neutron can couple to the, um, the, the internal molecular excitation, rotational excitation, absorb its rotational energy, and then come down convert uh, the single state to the triple state. And then this will also lead to a loss. And then you, you have to control. This is also para-ratio, uh, para D to ratio to be better than 1%. So after we figure out this problem, the source actually works great. So this is one idea of how we test also the neutral source. Is that we have a, a tungsten target. We shine protons onto tungsten target. So the spallation process leads to a lot of fast neutrons. And then you want the fast neutron to first moderate uh, moderated to around uh, 100 Kelvin by using a 77K polyacetylene, which has uh, a lot of hydrogen material there. And then, uh, so this so, uh, moderated neutron bouncing around uh, inside this flux trap, which is made of beryllium reflector here, and the solid deuterium D2 is on the very bottom of a stainless steel, highly polished internal uh, guide. So, on the bottom, the ultra cool neutron is produced and slowly diffused out of the source and then climb up against gravity and then into the storage bottle. We can open and close the entrance and exit valve, allowing us to store ultra cool neutron or just count the ultra cool neutron into this uh, detector as you saw. Okay, you can have very different parameters inside the source. For example, change the, the, the bad para D2 concentration and extract the lifetime, which is consistent with what we calculated. So you can see that as we pull the temperature of the solid down, and then ultra -cone, the system lifetime increase, and the ultra cold neutron yield increase as well. So this is so-called the super thermal yield, the super thermal behavior of, the, of such a source. Um, we can also, by increasing the amount of proton put on the target, so here we have about 10 pulses of proton on the spallation target, then after a while, we open the exit valve of the storage bottle, and then all the electrical neutrons streaming into the detector. Notice that the time scale we are counting here is on the order of seconds, or 10 seconds. So those electrical neutrons really move very slowly through the guide into the detector. Um, so we had um, the world record of a storable ultra-control density, 100 UCM per cc, and uh, the plus about uh, 4 times 10 to 4 UCM per second. You can also increase the size of deuterium crystal on the bottom of the guide here. So on the bottom of the guide is a pile of stats pulled by uh, uh, helium. <coughs> uh, the solid is transparent, uh, but you can increase the height. You can see that as the volume of the solid increase, ultra cool neutron yield also increase until it comes to the saturation. So the saturation corresponds to the height of 4 cm, which is the mean free, mean free pass of neutron inside the solid D2. Which is okay. So um, we make a deuterium source work, uh, working um, just in the beginning of the year 2000. And then later on, it's get verified uh, by different laboratory in, uh, say, PSI and at Mines and uh, Munich. So now let's look beyond helium and D2. There are also other possible uh, UCM source. Okay, all rely on you need to have a good ratio of the total scattering cross section over the nuclear absorption cross section. So nitrogen is good. <coughs> Oxygen 16 is also good, net 2 is good. However, net 2 is too heavy for neutrons to couple to the 